40 years, 40 years since the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada got started. Actually, the Brain Research Fund in those days. Brain Research Fund Foundation of Fun London. Of London, that's right. You know, and here we are, you know, now an organization that stretches right across Canada. And, uh, I, you know, I reflect back on that and I think of, you know, when Kelly, when Kelly was sick and she was in the hospital and I talked to Roly at the time and he was, uh, you know, gave us what information he could find. There was very little information on brain tumors at that time. And, and uh, that was very frustrating for us. I mean, very, very frustrating because you couldn't get, you couldn't get the information in those days that you can get now. No internet, you know, in those days. Nothing. And, uh, you know, thankfully, you know, it went on, we went on to uh, talk afterwards and, and Roly came up with the idea that he was starting a lab and then we asked for donations and, you know, just one thing just kind of led to another and here we are. Back you know? at the kitchen table, apparently. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting to think back, you know, I think it's hard for people to think of what, you know, the 1970s was like related to brain tumor um, treatment, <clears throat> diagnosis. There was no MR scans at that time. CT scans had just been developed in the early 70s. And um, as a neurosurgeon and a neurosurgeon resident in particular, I went through that time period. And clearly it was a time period of uh, less hope, for sure, than there is now. And I think, you know, I think thinking back, maybe one of the important aspects of this whole organization is the idea of bringing forward hope. That over a period of time, questions will be asked, uh, solutions will be uh, found and we'll move forward. I think we've been moving forward over the last 40 years. I think you're right. I think that, uh, you know, uh, I think we all wanted hope. That's what we were looking for. We were looking for hope. We were looking for hope. We were looking for answers, but we also wanted hope. Hope was the big thing, you know. It still is today. That's mm -hmm. the one thing that hasn't changed at all is the hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and hope, <clears throat> hope is a very important part for humans. I mean, humans have to think and people have to believe that there is, there's answers to these problems. Mm -hmm. Sometimes these answers can be spiritual. Sometimes these answers can be, you know, associated with medical care. Sometimes they'd be involved with friendships. And I think probably the friendship that the three of us have had over these years mm -hmm. may be one of the more interesting parts of, uh, oh, of the story and, uh, and something that we have to, uh, I think, be proud of that over these years we've kept, uh, kept we're still friends. Very, very good friends. <laughs> We're still friends. And married. And, and married. And, and married. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't think we could have done it if we weren't friends, you know, because uh, I can remember coming back to your office and, and, and saying to you, uh, so, so what's happening with this brain research fund? Are we going to do something with it? And, uh, and you said, you want to? And, and I said, yes. And you said, well, come on over to the house tonight and we'll sit down with Pam. And we did. We actually literally sat down around the little kitchen table. It was and, small. Uh, it was small. And uh, came up with a plan, and uh, it just kind of developed that, you know, uh, very quickly that you were the visionary, Roly, and Pam was looking after the patient, and the patient's idea and support. Never, never let us forget about the patients, which was really important. And of course, I was the guy who was looking for information, but at the same time, I wanted to get out and do the marketing and the communications, and I had the the wherewithal to do that at the time, which is good. I, I think the amazing thing is that we actually believed that we could do it. You know, I'm 70 now, and if someone said I should do something like this now, I would say I don't believe we can do it. But we had sort of the enthusiasm of youth. I see 40s as youth. And we nothing stopped us. We just, yeah. we just plowed ahead. I don't know if we were naive or we were enthusiastic. Naive. Well, maybe, maybe naivety is part of it. Is part yeah. of it, right? Yep. That, yep. that you believe you can do it. Because actually, the truth is, I remember you got a letter saying, stop what you're doing. People didn't think we should do it. Mm -hmm. We should, any funds or anything we did for brain mm -hmm. tumors could be rolled into the hospital or, you know, the major cancer uh, agencies that existed at the time. But we said, no, we're going to do it our own way, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so there was I think a bit it of was opposition. yeah, and I think it was because you had specific things in mind that you needed. Roly had was starting the lab, and he needed to have equipment, and it was costly equipment, mm -hmm. and um, this was a way to help him reach that. You know, to actually purchase the equipment and get that lab going, so that uh, we could find a cure for uh, brain tumors. And as as we've often said, um, when when you started, you thought that it would, in, within five years, you'd have a cure. I mean, naivety plus. <laughs> that's right, that's right. yeah, I think that's, that was my goal. I thought in yeah, five years from now, 
Yeah. No, you yeah. knew better. But I think we always know. had we always had goals. I think that yes. that's probably the the important. Even as small as we were, we always had goals. And I always remember lining up speaking engagements, and uh, I'd call different uh, organizations like the Rotary Clubs and the Lions Clubs and any other club that would talk to us. And uh, the hook was, I'm bringing along a neurosurgeon, <laughs> and everybody wanted to hear a neurosurgeon. You know, so rocket scientists were really hard to find, but neurosurgeon, I had one. So we said, okay, let's yeah. go with that. And uh, so, no, that worked out really well. And I think that we always had a, a, a good two-prong approach that uh, I would tell the story of Kelly and how, how the Brain Tour Foundation got started, and then Roly would get into uh, talking about uh, the Brain Tour situation and, and uh, the problem that it was creating in the world. Yeah. And also, I think, <clears throat> you know, I think, you know, at that particular time period, it became very clear to us, especially with um, some of the pediatric tumors, that um, the response of some of the pediatric tumors and what was happening uh, to those children was a was a very um, you know difficult aspect of the whole aspect of, of brain tumors. You know, I think when you look back, I mean, leukemia was uh, that time even at that time leukemia was was by far the most common disease associated with cancer in children. But it was already beginning to uh, have responses, and over the over the time period, of course, you know, the vast majority of children with leukemia appeared to do quite well, but this, this hadn't really happened with brain tumors. We hadn't really had treatments that were very effective, and therefore that, that left a, a sort of a hole in the whole area of, of research. I think you should talk a little bit about Kelly. Let's remember about Kelly and her role. Well, what you know, you went through, that's maybe. right. I think that, uh, you know, uh, we stop and think about Kelly and her legacy, of course, uh, in my mind, has always been the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, and I think you know, when she got sick and uh, we found out it was an inoperable brain tumor and, you know, at that time we only could have a CT scan, that was it. And uh, so now, I mean, the, the equipment that they have right now is so much better. And uh, when she went into the hospital and, and uh, we uh, just saw her just, you know, just within six months, you know, she kind of faded away and, uh, you know, went into a coma and then, and then she died. But uh, up to that point, I mean, she was a bright, vivacious little girl that uh, just was always doing well at school. And the only thing was she was getting sick in the morning, just getting sick in the morning, and we couldn't figure out why. And, and then that's when the uh, CT scan showed that there was, a, there, there was a mass there in her brain and that it had to be dealt with. But the trouble was being in the brain stem, they couldn't do anything with it. And uh, so it was very frustrating, I think, for us at the ho in the hospital at the time uh, because of the fact that we didn't have any information we didn't know what was going on. And uh, so that's, I, I guess, one of the things I've, I'm so proud of as an organization right now that we have all the information. We have a lot of information. We have, we have information that we can give patients. We have for the caregivers, for the uh, patients, for themselves. We've even got a coloring book and we've got a little a book that kids can read. And, you know, there's so much more now in the way of resources now, thanks to all the support that we've received over the years. You know, we've been so fortunate to have people get behind us over the years and to build the organization to, to from the kitchen table to right across Canada. Yeah. And I think, uh, Pam, maybe uh, <clears throat> your input as far as getting together volunteers and putting together the first handbook, which was the initial concern that Carolyn and, and Steve had, that they had no information and to go by. And you created that, that handbook um, around a board table, printing it, uh, collating yeah. it. <laughs> Remember and the first one we printed, the Levats? Levats, yeah, Levats. Uh, we had that little spiral and we put them all together one night. Yeah. I think there was some beer in the fridge at Levats for yes. us. Yes, yeah. the Amber Lounge. Mm -hmm. There was, Amber Lounge. yeah, that was yeah. a good and, point. And Gary was so, so, uh, you know, important at that time period, you know, being involved with the uh, Levats at that time and also being involved in helping us so much with Well, when I was writing the handbook, I would hand write things and mm -hmm. fax them to Gary. Yeah. And Gary would input them. I mean, that's, yeah. that's how, that's how right. bad it was. At that Forty point. years later, somebody's saying, a fax, what's a fax? I know, <laughs> I know. And, and the volunteers all around the table and everyone yeah. just... I can remember having the collating yeah. party where we, we yeah. walked around the tables, took page one, page two, page three. And that's had, right. And I mean, that brings up volunteers. You start talking about volunteers, and I mean, you know, uh, really, I mean, 
our organization has been so lucky to have fantastic volunteers yeah. over the years, you know, from families and families and friends and mm -hmm. everybody involved. You know, I think of all the people I work with at the newspaper and, I mean, all the people that you were connected with through the hospital. I mean, we couldn't have done it without them. I mean, one, it's just... It's one, of our, yeah. one of our strongest volunteers for many, many years at the foundation I met in the lineup at Tim Hortons. And someone said, never sit beside Pam at a meeting anywhere <laughs> because you're going to be volunteering for the Brain Tumor That's Foundation right. of Canada, which That's was right. our enthusiasm. That's obviously. right. You could be working a bingo or yeah, a fashion show in no matter. time. I could <laughs> come in. And all through the years, it, it, whether it be... Um, coming in and putting uh, those handbooks, putting using an old binding machine or cutting the edges to make them straight or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, people would come in to do that. And we had some fundraisers that were great. Um, we had um, from Westmount Mall, we had to roll pennies. Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. thousands of wet pennies that Steve would pick up uh, in pails and bring them in and we'd spread towels out on the board <laughs> table on the board table. And, <laughs> and a fan going on I it. Forgot and then, about the then the banks said they wouldn't take them and because there was <laughs> chlorine rusting. on them. Yeah, chlorine on chlorine them. On oh them. geez, yeah. And then uh, up in Thessalon a few years later, how much is a million people uh, collected? A million pennies in Thessalon Public School because the principal's daughter had a brain tumor and that this was their way of helping. And yep. there, 200 empl uh, volunteers came out. So yep. our whole existence has been on volunteers. Without yes. them, we would have nothing. Yeah. And it continues <clears throat> to be. And um, as, we, as we were helping people along the way, we were all feeling good about it. Mm -hmm. And I think that we could see progress. And uh, you know, I, I think that helping others just became part of what we wanted to do. That's what the whole organization was all about, really. It was all about, thanks to Pam, because Pam mm -hmm. always kept us focused on the That's patient right. and, uh, and, and their families. And, and I think that when we saw them improve or uh, feel better and come out and volunteer and do something with us, then we knew that we were on the right track. And I, and I see that all the time now, even in information days. Even yes. today. You know? yeah, I think the, ba the major thing I, I felt related to the information, you know, the handbook, was that you could, you could have the information in the handbook, but as a physician, I was able to sort of write down for that particular patient in the, in the back part of that handbook, the initial handbooks, you know, what the diagnosis was, information, and, and, a, and actually show them things and so they could refer to that later on. And I think that was one of the initial very important parts of that handbook, be able to write down information for the patient. Because sometimes, it, you know, when you're talking to someone who, who you know, that's a very stressful situation, you know, where they have a, a problem in their family, it's very difficult for them to bring in all the information or remember the information and having the handbook there where you could check off things and write things and circle things was really a critical mm -hmm. Well, the problem, the problem with uncertainty <coughs> is the idea that you don't know where you're going. You know, you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know what's going to happen to your loved one or yourself. And so one of the advantages of having uh, information is it begins to decrease that uncertainty. And as you decrease that uncertainty, there's a certain, there's an ability of the human mind to sort of begin to deal with that problem. <laughs> it allows depression to decrease. It allows happiness to bubble up a little bit, and hope and hope to sort of uh, come forward. And I think if you don't have the important information about a specific problems, you're sometimes left in the dark. You're you're left in this funny world where you don't understand what's happening. And the, <laughs> That's a very dangerous part, place for people to be. You're talking about being a parent. I mean, you know, that's yeah, a, being that's a right. parent with a, a child with a brain tumor. That, and in those days, I mean, you know, you were, uh, you had to rely on the doctors to really tell you. And I know doctors are very busy and they didn't have time. And they don't have all the answers either sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, But you expected that. And, yeah, I think the uncertainty was something that we had to... Uh, and deal with impressed. and it was it was it, it was very 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 hard very and hard. i think i think pam pam through the <coughs> well, through the two things really the handbook and also the the support, the support groups. groups the support groups are critical i think and but, that's what do. but to go back to the handbook you know one of the reasons we did the handbook was as steve mentioned families needed information and there really there was no internet there was really no information so that was one of our early mantras we have to get good factual information but today there's the internet but it's the same problem with uncertainty because there's this mm -hmm. much out there and you know what families and patients need is good quality 
information about brain tumors, mm -hmm. diagnosis, treatment, research. They and don't so, need fake news. They well, need yeah. reality. They don't need yeah. fake news. And so it's the same problem 40 years later. Um, mm -hmm. The same problem is, you know, uncertainty, lack of the, the true uh, core of information. And that's, you know, that's how the Brain Tumor Foundation started with good information and they still today. So I think that uh, that part. I think if anybody's different. looked at our website, I mean, our website is, uh, is so current and so up to date yeah. and it's got so much good positive information on there. And there's a, and that, factual information, but also positive stories, support. stories of people of support, you know, of how they've how they've improved their lives after a brain tumor and I think that that's, a, that's another area that we haven't really talked about and that is how much the care for brain tumors has has progressed so far as compared to what it was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean as far as from an operating point. The thing I've always liked, the thing I, I think is really great and I, I've said this to many people is the when, when Kelly was sick it was you dealt with the radiologist he just said it was strictly radiology. And if you talk to the oncologist, he said, no, it's just oncology. You talk to the surgeon, he said, no, it's just surgery. Now, they put a package together. And I think that's really, really uh, indicative of the young doctors that came along. And they weren't set in the ways of doing things the same way all the time. And when I say a package, I'm talking about, you know, they come up with a program. A team. You know, a team. Mm -hmm. It's a team approach now that uh, it, gives, it gives parents so much more hope and so much more insight into what's going to happen in the future, you know, as far as, uh, okay, we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this step, and then we're going to do that step, and then everything should be okay. And I think you know? when we started the information days, that <clears throat> really came to the forefront because we would have a panel discussion, and each one of the um, uh, aspects were covered. So you did have oncologists, you did have a neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. um, and social workers, and therapists and we had uh, uh, by bringing that in it gave an opportunity you know what I'm going to say I know what you're thinking <laughs> I know what you're thinking okay, okay. Our first, let go, the us Busby know. Room. Go, go for it yes the Busby Room our first room. information yeah. day yeah. Uh, we decided we would provide some babysitting and we had Glenn Bennett I think yep. he was a children's mm -hmm. entertainer and yep. um Rolly dressed as a clown. Yeah. That's right. That's he, right. He wanted to be the Cookie Monster, but That's the right. costume I rented wouldn't fit him, so I was the Cookie Monster. Now, oh, we have to get him back there. A picture about that. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I, I, I've it. seen that picture. We a few have times. a picture. Yes, yeah. that we, we can provide. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah the but Buzz you know, when I, you know, when you think about it, though, let, if we think about forty years, let's think about forty years. So we start in a situation where you know, the seventies, you you begin to have a CT scanner. You move you move forward with more information about. MR scans and all the other technology we have now. As far as you know, treatments are concerned. You know what what what's been the most important thing that has happened? Like if you look in the operating room, for example, obviously we've improved. Mm -hmm. You know we have all kinds of things in the operating room that we didn't have before. We're moving into artificial intelligence. We're moving into virtual reality. Better better systems to work there. But probably the most important thing that's going to happen over the next period of time is continuing the unraveling of the genetics of tumors. Why do certain individuals, children, for example, and, and young adults, get brain tumors? Mm -hmm. You know, and if you look, if you look at the real question, we don't know. Forty years later, we do not. Forty know. years later, we still ask the same question. We we mm -hmm. still ask the same question, and if that question can be answered, and hopefully will be answered, as a genetic the genetics get unraveled about the complexities of brain tumors, we are getting closer. There's no question we're getting closer. We know now, for example, that each, you know, if you have a particular tumor in one part of the brain, another part of the brain, that, you know, they're different. There's this difference that occurs. Mm -hmm. We are getting there. And I, and I think back, and I'm trying to, you know, when we think about the Brain Tumor Foundation, of kind of what, what was one of the more important things that we developed at that time? And I think that was the, the brain tumor tissue bank. Mm -hmm. Tissue bank, yeah, that was very, very important. And the reason that was important is that we began to think not for that moment in time, but for the future. Mm -hmm. Because obviously all the technology, all the chemistry, etc., was not available at that time. But there was the idea that eventually things would come about. And when those things came about, then the tissue that we had saved from patients who have had the tumor. Many of those patients had, had passed away, but we still had the tissue. And they then, with that tissue, made a substantial contribution. They contributed. To the mm -hmm. people who came after. Yes, for sure. And that's why, that's why I think, you know, it's the same thing with all the patients, for example, 
that went into trials. I mean, we, we think about, you know, that this, this is some type of magic, but it isn't. It's people who go into trials, and many of those trials didn't work out very well for some patients, for sure, but they still went into them. And I think that's another aspect of it. These, I, and I think it wasn't it. only Canada. I mean, those, those tissue samples were sent oh, all right. over. Our sent. Our sent, oh, and oh. still yeah. all over the world. I think that uh, the tissue bank, when I, I think back on it, I remember you talking to us about, you know, we have to we want to buy this tissue bank, and I think it was $10,000. That's the number that keeps on coming yeah. to my head, was $10,000 at the time. To buy this refrigerator, this I refrigerated unit, refrigerator. And, yeah. and I remember we had to go make a presentation uh, at the Knights of Columbus Hall uh, over at St. Justin's, and uh, we were up against uh, Father Pat Mellon, and he wanted money for his uh, his camp, and here we are going head to head against the priest who's running the uh, the, the church at the time, but uh, thankfully, uh, you know, I remember uh, Levine, I remember Pat Levine, and and, and those people, they they kind of saw uh, our you know, our project is being much more uh, viable and something that they could really contribute to. And they really got into that. They, when I remember when they, they bought the, the first tissue bank, was great. And then we, we got the hospital to, 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 to look room. after it. And then all of a sudden they were going to cancel that and we had to take it on as part That's of right. our budget. And I think it's one of the one, most wonderful things we've ever done because... Uh, well, it did help crack the oligodendroglioma yeah. problem. <clears throat> yeah, I think, I think, you know, people may not know and I think it's not out there very much, is that that particular brain tumor tissue bank, because of all the tissue that was in it, allowed a number of researchers, both in London and in Boston, to really crack the problem of, at least the initial genetic problem associated with, with the oligodendrogliomas, which is one of the more common types of tumors in young people. And so, although, again, it was a, a small amount, if you can think about it, the idea of putting the tissue away for other for other researchers to use that tissue years mm -hmm. in advance, in in one way I think shows some of the things that the Brain Tumor Foundation has been doing for all, all the time. And doing very well. It's very true. Very, very, very true. Thinking not of now, but what are people going to need in a year? And and, and I think well, that, I think I think the idea of, of the the issue of the uh, support groups was that, you know, you don't start a support group for one time, no. for that patient for once. No. You started so that they could come back for for as long as they needed. Now, Pam, you were the you started. Remember, you started the first London support group. Well, I think that I kind of had a support group going in our waiting room. Remember, that's yes, that, that's yes. right. <laughs> I would always do, right. I would do introducing did. patients yeah. back and forth and trying yeah. to, you know, yeah. And that's when I realized there was a need. And I remember when we had the very first one in London. Mm -hmm. Uh, my hands are sweaty now even thinking about it. I was so nervous. I was so scared. We set up chairs at 111 Waterloo, and mm -hmm. we didn't think anybody would come, and I think we had like 30 people. Like yeah. We had way too many people. But And they were so mm -hmm. enthusiastic yeah. Yeah. because they wanted what you were providing, and that was hope and information and, uh, and just loving support. And we got a grant yeah. mm -hmm. because that was so successful in London. We got a grant from the Ontario government to pay Terry mm -hmm. part-time for a year to set up support groups in southwestern Ontario. Remember all those winter nights you'd come home, I wasn't there, I was in Sarnia, Waterloo, I was all Kitchener. over the, Kitchener. Yeah. Yeah. And then we started getting requests from all over Canada, different yeah. provinces Eventually. about people, how can you help yeah. us? And mm -hmm. you know, I think that uh, that might have been kind of, kind of came around the same time as the webs, you know, the, the webs started coming into play and I think that people started hearing about us and asking, yeah. how can you help me and asking for information and then mm -hmm. you would talk to them and say, how about setting up a support group and at that time Melody was our ED and, and, so, and she would talk to them as well and say, well, have you thought about setting up a support group and we'd send all the materials out to them and, they, and they'd set up their own little support groups in Halifax or someplace you know, like that. I, I used to go to a number of the support groups. Yeah, but he could. changed them all. Like he, yeah. the, the neurosurgeon <laughs> came to support groups. That, like, that's I was a, just going to say that, you know, it's that's a question. Useful. It's that's not, a question time. Then yeah, that's right. He wrapped them up. It's not, yeah. it's not, it's not yeah. an important question. That's right. Important thing they about. loved when he came. Yes. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. They loved it. In fact, one one year for my birthday, um, he decided to surprise me because my birthday was support group night, and he shows up. A big surprise. I'm supposed to be thrilled, but then. He ran the whole support group. I know. <laughs> yeah. I think I made the coffee or yeah. something. Yeah. Well, like I say, we went out to speak. If I said I was bringing a neurosurgeon, know, it was just like, oh, okay. That's but you know, good. the support groups to this day, I mean, they just ran themselves. Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, you just mm -hmm. needed to get the group started and away they would go. And I remember Ben, we had in London, we had a university student, Ben, who ended up working for the Brain Tumor Foundation mm -hmm. of Canada, actually. And so he was 18. And, you know, the brain tumor, uh, 
a group that I had at the time. We were probably 50 and over, most, most people. And um, what Ben didn't know is he was coming into a den of mother hens. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, are you getting to bed? And are you sleeping enough? And he had started university. Oh, my God, they were all over him about that and his exams. And um, I think he was a little um, nervous about it at first. But at the end, he always came back. He loved that support group. He loved that and group of people. he's still involved today. Him. He yeah. still they, is a they loved him. Uh, support, supporter of it. Support is important in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. But one of the most intangible kinds of support you can have is one brain tumor patient talking to another brain tumor That's patient so true. Yep. and explaining how they feel and then hearing the group, sorry, watching the group, hearing the interactions. Mm -hmm. I think it's sort of like the, the basic level of support. And you know, here we are 40 years later and because of the, the, the last two years have been pandemic time, and now it's still evolving. People are online, they're doing mm -hmm. Zoom meetings, mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. are using Facebook support groups. It is just phenomenal how, um, when you give people an opportunity to say, can you help? I'm kind of going back to what we were talking about, getting the, the volunteers helping. If you give people that opportunity to help, they can run with it. And it's yeah. even on the, you know, you watch different sitcoms now on TV and stuff like that. They're talking about brain tumors. They're talking about yeah. people uh, being having the operation now because I think people are much more aware of it now. Yeah. I think before, as we always said before, sometimes the uh, unfortunately the life expectancy sometimes of a brain tumor patient was very was very short. And I think that that's where we always we had talked about that one time where it wasn't one of those diseases that lingered. And uh, as compared to now. Now I think with all the actual treatment that we have now and with the uh, surgical treatments they have now and, the, and different medications, uh, brain tumor patients are definitely living a lot longer now than what they lived in, in, in 40 years ago. I, want, I just want to tell you a story. I got an email about two days ago and it was about an individual uh, and um, I, had, I had seen him when, uh, about over 20 years ago mm -hmm. now I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had been seen in another center, and, and they had suggested that he would have a life expectancy of one or two years. It was 2001. Yeah, and, uh, and so we, we talked about this, but the fascinating thing at that time was that the, the genetics wasn't very available at that time, and we, we had the capacity to do the genetics in other places. Didn't. And the genetics suggested that his particular tumor was, was a much less of a concern. He had a, a 19Q. Uh, a specific abnormality that suggested a better prognosis. And with that better prognosis, we decided to treat him in a very specific way. And, you know, getting an email from him uh, 20, 20, years, 20 later. years later, he has hmm. you know, teenage children, uh, went through chemotherapy and other things. He lives like in that. South America? Yes, and he lives in South America. He, he's, he's, a, you know, he's involved with, with uh, he, he was an engineer involved in geophysics. and. And so, you know, those are the types of stories that, that weren't that common back then. No, no. Yeah, but they're common now. But they're common now, and, and I think that those are the ones that really light up your heart, right? And, yeah. and you realize that in some minor way, uh, uh, probably, we have had a big impact on that particular uh, thing. Well, yeah, happening. going back, I, I you know, the, re the reason that we had the 1P and 19Q was because that was developed... You through know, our brain tumor tissue yeah. bank. Right, so the that person, you know, that mm -hmm. person personally had you know, a, a substantial improvement because of our knowledge about his tumor yeah. that we would not have had without that. Because he could have gone on or probably would have gone on to more aggressive treatment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. And not done as well based on the aggressive yeah. treatment that he didn't need. Well, as, as, as we were saying earlier, you know, like, I mean, as far as the, the team approach versus the right. individual approach, I can always remember Dr. Banerjee smoking a pipe in his office, sitting there smoking a pipe, Office is all filled with smoke and everything else, and telling me that Kelly, the radiation was the only way to go, and stuff like that. I mean, it, it, you think back on that, and you realize how much, how far we've come in 40 years. Oh, yeah. But I mean, at the same time, now they just realize that radiation is not the way to go with children. But that's a whole other story. But and you know, it's funny. I was just, I'm just, just going to say, I was reading in our, in our hope in action here. I just had it uh, out in the table, and. You know, sometimes we lose sight almost of, of how many wonderful things that are happening, you know, with our organization. I mean, you know, you look at $86,000 into the brain tumor tissue bank, 125000 into a five-year pediatric cancer uh, impact grant. Um, a brain, the Brain Tumor Registry of Canada was launched. Five childhood brain tumor survivors were awarded youth education awards. 
uh, three healthcare professionals development awards, 15 in-service presentations reaching over 255 health prof care professionals, 230 support group meetings, you know, 230 plus, 3,355 handbooks handed out, 10 wave, or 16 wave, oh, brain yeah, wave yeah, events, yeah. you know, uh, 1,000, uh, 1,008 participants in either person or online joined the third uh, National Brain Tumor Conference in Montreal and Toronto. We had two young adult retreats, three care, care, caregiver, sorry, caregiver wellness days. There's just so many things that are happening. I mean, and, and I'm so proud of our organization, you know, for what they're for what they're doing, you know, with the money they receive. I mean, how they're dispersing it and helping so many people. I think the other thing that's important when we're thinking about these types of things is really the idea of some spirituality involved in yes. this aspect of it. Yeah. You know, because I I think I'll you know, one of the things that influences me, influenced me the most when I was a social with, with um, doing an operation was, you know, I, I was very involved in doing operations with patients who were awake. Mm -hmm. And uh, every once in a while during an awake operation, although we're able to, you know, to, um, the, brain doesn't, the brain doesn't have any, um, any uh, pain fibers, so that's not really an issue. But people do get, do get stressed, and, and sometimes you have to actually stop the operation. And I and I was, this was happening in this particular lady's case, and, and it was she was getting more and more stressed. The anesthesiologist was more and more concerned that she was getting stressed, and maybe we'd have to stop the operation. And I knew that she was religious, and so I said to her, "You know, you're religious," and she said, "Yes." I said, uh, "And she prayed." Mm -hmm. And she started to pray. In the OR. In the, in the OR. OR. Can you operate on? Yeah. Can you operate on awake? And I looked around and the anesthetist was praying. The nurses were praying. She was praying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. He's still moved by it. Yes, I can tell. <laughs> it is moving. I mean, you know. And you can see. And she did okay. And then. And she calmed down, and the and power of prayer down. kind of got her through uh, that and moment. And the operation just went forward, no problem. Now, I got to just bring up one about this operating when the person is alive, uh, or at least awake, or right, right, so uh, awake. Please keep awake. Because by doing that, you could you could tell if you hurt certain mm -hmm. areas in the brain where you know, we had to pull back or something. And uh, he actually wanted to call his grandmother or something in the waiting mm -hmm. room. And I remember. Uh, you're telling us how, how uh, or he said, he was telling us a story about how he had uh, made the phone call to the waiting room and talked to his, his grandma. He didn't remember any of it afterwards, but uh, it was, I thought it was that, memory for that. When, 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 you, when you tell people about the, the um, uh, somebody having an operation uh, while they're awake, they can't believe it. Yeah. You know, it. It's very hard to believe. But you know, again, I think part of the process is that, you know, an organization has to use all the resources they have available. And I think, the spiritual resources of children playing with each other, you know, and interacting, and you know, the, the churches have been involved in helping us over a number of years yes. and things mm -hmm. like that. Well, many support groups were in churches. Many, many, yeah. many, 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 many support groups. Mm -hmm. And there, whenever we asked, uh, okay. every single church we ever asked, it, yes. So, so those, you know, that's part of being involved with your with the community too. That yep. you, you can't be sort of an island or a ship in the sea. You know, you have to. You have to be part of the community, and I think that may be one of the most important things about the Brain Tumor Foundation that it started that way as part of the community. And it's continued to be. It's continued to be. And the community is, is, you know, initially it was a smaller community, but now it's a whole community of patients mm -hmm. across Canada, their loved ones, and people that have happen to have the problem. And there's so many right. other therapies that are available for people too. There's Reiki therapy and, and meditation and and things that people can that we're open to now to include so that how people can cope better. Yep. I think you were taking us back to 40 years ago. Did we, what do we expect? Well, I think if I, if I look, look at it from, from that time period, I think the expectation was that there would be an evolution of, you know, sort of knowledge about you know, brain tumors, how they start, how they grow, how, we can be defeated, how they can be defeated. And I actually remember many, many times with you and with Pam when we would talk. You know, I would say that you know the hope would be one day we won't need a brain tumor foundation anymore. 
And the reason being that if we understand how tumors develop, we can hopefully prevent them, and therefore there will be no need for human loss to exist. Uh, so that, I guess, would be the long-term hope that the, the uh, you know, the biology will is moving so quickly now that, that I think there is hope that in the next 10 or 20 years, we'll be able to, you know, identify which, which people are more likely to have tumors and which people are going to be uh, able to be cured by just not letting them have those particular types of problems. And then we'll know, you know, and maybe that even surgery may not be very important. And all the wall we may do is take a biopsy, figure out what your genetic, genetics are, and we know exactly how to treat you. So, you know, there's there's an evolution that's going to occur. That's amazing, isn't it, when you think about why? Well, that, that's so far in 40 years. That's going to be the future. And, you know, if you think about where we've gone so far in the 40 years, I think the next 40 years are just going to be unbelievable, you know. And you can think about that, you know, we're going to move to the idea if people do have a defect, for example, after you know, having a brain tumor removed, we may be able to improve that. We may be able to use various types of, of a, you know, this, this brain sort of, you know, sort of human interaction with machines and things that help people in those ways. So there's going to be all kinds of things that are going to happen in the future. It, but it goes probably, to hope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably the most important thing is that the idea of, of people helping other people. People helping people. And, yeah. I, and I think that's the, the foundation wouldn't function unless we had, unless we have money to make research happen mm -hmm. and to keep uh, the support services going and to keep the, um, the volunteers out there doing other fundraising. Mm -hmm. um, but the, um, I think the, if we look back over the years, it's been such a variety of people helping us and doing all these fundraisers and we've had some pretty wild times. Well we've had some pretty interesting fundraisers mm -hmm. over the years. Remember that's the so ten dollar ones? Yes, yeah, well really they, there was, short we, we could share this with the with the people I think. This is kind of funny, but we uh, <laughs> we used to go out and talk Rolly and I were a, a dog and pony team or you know Mutt and Jeff and we would go out there and we would talk to organizations and one time a sorority group asked us to come to talk to them at their house. And a beautiful home, just a gorgeous home. We pulled up in front of it and thought, oh boy, this, this should be good. So we walked in there and I think there was about six or seven women and we, we talked to them and we, we, we spent, we were in there for at least two a hours, a couple hours anyway. And, uh, and then we came out and uh, they gave us an envelope at the end of our talk. We thanked them very much and we left and we got back in the car and always said, so what's in the envelope? And I opened it up and there was, Ten dollars. <laughs> was, it was kind of a shock, but you know, when you stop and thought about it afterwards, we thought, that's okay. That's ten dollars. That's what they could afford to give us, and that's. But we still got the story out. We told them about brain tumors. They were more knowledgeable than when we left than what they were when we first got there. And uh, but you know, even to this day, uh, everybody who's donating to us, you have to realize we treasure your donation, whether it's ten dollars, twenty dollars. $50, $100, whatever you can afford to help us continue to find a cure for this devastating disease. That's that's how the organization was built and that's how we will continue to grow and we'll continue to help people, provide information. And uh, it's hope in action, just like our, our newsletter says, it's hope in action. And I would say too, if you're gonna make a donation to the foundation, large or small, to always think that the organization exists for someone that you don't know to pick up the phone and say, my child, my husband, my loved one has a brain tumor. What will I do? Where will I go? What, who will I call? And if you give a donation, it supports those activities for the foundation. I think the most important thing to think about is giving even a small donation helps. You know, money is one thing, but, but hope is another. And money sometimes helps hope move down its, its path. And, uh, I think overall we all have to, you know, we all have to care about our community and, and one way of caring about our community is helping by providing money and, and being a volunteer. I mean, I think we have to go back to that idea that mm -hmm. how important it is to be a volunteer. Well, a volunteer is money, really. Yep. And, and, it, it's, and the other thing about being a volunteer is you're helping. You're really, really helping. And you're meeting wonderful people along yeah. the way, too. Well, I people think people are, people are probably be interested to know that... Uh, 
we were volunteers. Yeah, absolutely. We've never we've never really yeah. uh, no. uh, worked for the organization for the Brain Tour Foundation. We've been uh, we've been volunteers right from day one, yeah, and uh, years. and we still are. We're still yeah. we're still reaching out to people whenever we yeah. we hear of anybody who needs. Uh, Needs help. I mean, we're there to help them. We're there to provide the information, yeah. whatever they need. And the board of directors yeah. and the advisors, and um, yeah. they, they're all volunteers. They all come from right across Canada to mm -hmm. uh, lend a hand. All the, the people fundraising. I mean, they're they're in there to have uh, to to take any step they can to help because they might not have the money. They might not have, but they might have an ability to do something. Um, we used to do rides for research, bike rides, um, uh, fashion shows. Um, oh my gosh. These, guys, right these right. guys love the fashion shows. Yes. I just <laughs> want you to know. They yeah, looked really did. dapper. That was their favorite fundraiser. <laughs> they looked really dapper yeah. in their tuxes. We got to wear tuxedos and have a good time. We should pull and, out uh, some of those pictures sometimes. But, but I think yeah. that was always good because, it was again, we were putting a face out there. We were, yeah. we were, always, uh, we were always willing to put our face out there, whether it was yes. working bingos or working... Uh, you know, we were probably the only. We probably had more high-priced help working bingos than most yes, local charities. Yes, when you have neurosurgeons and nurses and doctors yeah, that are coming had, out uh, to help. We had a lot of help, people, yeah. and, but they were all there. And I mean, I was just reading in the uh, Hope, Hope in Action. It's a 2019 version, but they were referring to 700 volunteers. You know, uh, taking place in that particular year, and that's mm -hmm. just in one year. And, and I think a lot of that is probably the walk too. I mean, you know, the walk that we have across mm -hmm. Canada now that that. Um, that came about, you know, through uh, through a meeting with the running room here in London, Ontario, and it just kind of expanded. And as I touched on earlier, I think it gave the support groups a way of, you know, contributing back and what have you. And now I think we have 26, 27 walks right across Canada. And, you know, that's the backbone of our organization mm -hmm. as far as uh, fundraising goes right now. It's about $1.5 million. Bring, come but again. also you the know? support, because on the walks, people meet people. The people that's meet right. people in the walks. And, so from my point of view, I, you know me. Exactly. exactly. We talk, I tell you, I love, the, I love the walk. I go, yeah. When I go down to London, then I have to get up and I talk, in Victoria Park and I talk to the groups out there. And, you know, you got a thousand people out there. And I've had all my grandkids up at different times talking to as well. And uh, they... You know, they they see what we're doing, and they're so proud of us as as an organization, as people, because they see us uh, giving back. And I think that that's something you, you don't even realize that we're passing along all these beliefs and all these uh, ideals to our children. Our children are the same way. You know, they 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 take a look and say, "Well, look at Nana and Papa. They you know they give back. We should give back too." And I think. And, but th those walks, I mean, I, I love them. I, I just love talking and, to hundreds of people out there and seeing their, uh, you know, they all have their different teams and they, uh, and they, 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 they're supporting it. But as you say, they're having fun and they're, they're supporting each other. You know, and and that's why that this 2020 with the Hope in Action, um, with the kids, the kids that come out to the walks, they have such a good time. And these are patients or uh, they have the brain tumor or their siblings do. And uh, multi generations come out and walk, uh, supporting them, and it's it's just um, it's is hope in action, and yep. the kids mm -hmm. have a lot of fun. Um, right, we started sort of uh, support groups for children and their families with brain tumors. The brain wave. Yeah, just we the support groups for adults were really uh, they were really well received. So we decided that we couldn't really. Well, we actually I think we did try to have a support group in London. Yes. Um, but it was just really hard because as you can well imagine, if you're a family and you would remember Steve, if you're a family and you have a child with a brain tumor, you don't exactly want to go out at night to a support group. It, it just didn't work. So what we decided to do was to have events. I think we had an event at a farm. We had an event at Cola Sandy's, all kinds of different sort of fun activities that were free. And families came together and met each other. So they provided their own support. We didn't have an exact program mm -hmm. and now it's evolved to much more sophisticated and it's a formal program in the brain tumor foundation of canada so i'm proud of that but it's wonderful i think the kids really enjoy it you know because yeah. they can yeah. they can they can see other kids that are going through a yeah. brain tumor and they understand right. and they can they talk in the same language and i think that the, that's so important it's so important for the kids and uh, the same you know, language. And, it gets, and it gets back to the same idea you know person helping another person yeah. exactly yeah. and the more the more you know the more of it they see those types of things. I think the more they they can sort of understand how, you know, there are issues that have to be dealt with, and they can help them to in their own way to do mm -hmm. it. Whether it's 
collecting pennies or walking or whatever. Yep. You know, they can do something that's helpful. And we provided a venue for them to have fun. That's yeah. right. Remember the magician and all the giggles yeah. in the audience? <laughs> well, and hear just when you were talking about Rose showing up in a clown outfit and you were dressed up like, uh, what were you? Cookie doing? Monster. Cookie Monster. Cookie Monster. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was just fun. I mean, you know, to. Uh, to, to see that kind of stuff. But no, we just went down to see our son in Tennessee for the first time since COVID started a couple of weeks ago. And the one thing he wanted to bring is we have a really large, like meter squared um, photo of us, Broly the Clown, me the Cookie Monster, and our children in a big bright yellow frame. And he said, could we bring that? He wanted to make sure that in our family that he got that picture. So oh, isn't that great? Now in isn't Tennessee. That great? That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, you know, we're working on four generations because yeah. we have Steve and myself, we have and Carolyn, um, his first wife, and all of our blended family, but we also have grandkids and great grandkids, and they are all. I mean, that's their foundation. They just love to be part of it. Especially the walk. They love the walk. Too. But I, I think the other thing that I notice is um, when we're giving, when we're doing things like this for, for families, the parents get an opportunity to see their children that are afflicted by a brain tumor get out there and have fun and actually have a normal, like, be able to run around and do all the normal things because that's the hardest things for parents to get used to is that their child changes so much. An adult changes. Um, wives say that about their husbands and husbands about their wives. And it's it, uh, having a brain tumor is a huge impact on your life and your, your normal process of life. And as Roley had said, these things give people hope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you know, I'd like to talk a little bit about advocacy because you've yes, been, you've been yes. on the forefront of the advocacy. Right? Well, you know, advocacy is a funny word. And, and when I started in this uh, unpaid job of mine, I don't think I really understood what advocacy and health policy really meant. And of course, over the years, I certainly have begun to understand it. And after um, the foundation had started, um, Melody and I actually went down to, I think it was San Francisco, and met with um, five other brain tumor groups. Mm -hmm. And the reason, um, it's a long story, but one of the groups had a newsletter uh, in the mail that I had found and I, I phoned them and I said, um, could I talk to you a little bit about um, networking and learning about what you do in the United States about brain tumors? And the, the man I talked to was, uh, was Michael McKechnie mm -hmm. and he was really evasive on the phone. And what happened was, when he, he hung up, called me back, and he said, listen, I didn't know whether I could do this or not, so I spoke to my people. And what had happened was there were five brain tumor groups in the United States at the time, and they were going to get together and talk about trying to influence government to supporting brain tumor uh, research and support for families. And they said, there's this Canadian person who called me, and can I invite them? <laughs> so they said yes. Uh, so they invited, Melody came down with me, and they invited us. And so the rest was history. There was a group called the North American Brain Tumor Coalition, made up of, up of all American groups and one Canadian group. And uh, they pulled some resources, hired a lawyer in Washington, D.C. And, you know, for me, that's when the idea that you could actually influence health policy And happened. Pam, you were down there in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. talking and advocating for uh, brain tumor patients, but also the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada, right. they just showing that we had to get together with the world, actually. Mm -hmm. um, not only did we send the brain tumor tissues everywhere, but we also had connections, and people were calling us from all over right. the world. So well, you had the an thing is... Yeah, Pam, you have to tell us about when we went down to Washington, mm -hmm. and we went to the embassy, the Canadian embassy in oh, Washington, okay. because that, that was a very important... Well, of first of all, I mean, my big mantra always was, and I know for all of us, is that brain tumors don't discriminate. They cross borders. You know, mm -hmm. there's no one stopping them either side, so they're everywhere. And um, uh, I, anyway, one year, for two years, actually, I was chair of the North American Brain Tumor Coalition in Washington, and our health policy lawyer said to me, why don't you have, we always had a reception, why don't you have it at the Canadian Embassy? So I had... I said, okay, I'll try. So I had to call the Canadian ambassador. <laughs> well, in fact, what happened was the Canadian ambassador called me. And I, I was at home in Montreal at the time. And it was just a cold call at like five or six in the evening. Said something like, I understand you want to have a reception at the Canadian embassy in Washington. Tell me why. 
So I had no chance to prepare, no chance to think about it. I just blurted out probably a lot of the things that I'm saying here today about, you know, how much we care, support, research, funding, all the things yeah. that are important. And um, they said yes. That's amazing. And I can't, <laughs> there, there's another backstory to that. And what's some, that uh, one? There's something about the fact that we sort of knew some individuals who were important and some that helped us also. Well, well, that was the, that precipitated the call, well, yes. Open some um, doors? Yes, open some doors, yes. We had some M MPs yeah. in, in Ottawa who put some one words of, in. One of, you know, one, of the, one of the members of Parliament actually sort of put something in the ear of the ambassador and suddenly, suddenly, yeah. we were in the embassy. Now what you know is who you know. That's right. And I so, think that's, yeah. that's, that's evident in a lot of stuff we've done. I was proud that night. There were hundreds of people yeah. in that audience and the yeah. Canadian flag was flying. And, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about, again, we got the word out to people. Um, about how important it is to consider brain tumors because as anyone who's watching this video knows For years and years and still today the concept of a brain tumor is lumped into cancer mm -hmm. Generic and as we know there's lots of brain tumors some are cancerous some aren't you know, we're different We're unique and that's the idea is to implement the policymakers that people who make the policy in the lands about where money most importantly where money is funneled and mm -hmm. you know what's available to to our uh, patients so I got the word out that night as best I could. I was proud. I'll yeah. bet you did. And that, and that <laughs> also. We have, a, yeah, we have that on right. VHS tapes. Wow. Yeah. Drag that out. Well, you know, I think that probably those kind of talks, I can remember we had some, some bills being passed yes, at different mm -hmm. times and different, yes. and they, uh, yeah. they were initiated at uh, our federal level and at a provincial level. And I know that uh, they've gone on from there. I mean, you know, now just recently, I mean, the the uh, new generation of the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada has has uh, now started a registry for non-malignant brain tumors and that all came about you know all through the advocacy role and uh, you know which you started and you did and kept on going we you know we've been very fortunate when you stop and think about it because we really haven't been involved in the day-to-day -day running of the organization for for quite a while i mean we still check in every now and then see how things are going and what have you and do things but that brings up volunteers you start talking about volunteers and i mean you know uh really i mean our organization has been so lucky to have fantastic volunteers yeah. over the years, you know, from families and families and friends and mm -hmm. everybody involved. You know, I think of all the people I work with at the newspaper and I mean, all the people that you were connected with through the hospital. I mean, we couldn't have done it without them. But here we are 40 years later and there's so many wonderful mm -hmm. things still happening thanks to all the people that support us on a regular basis. The volunteers, the people that donate, the programs. And all the help. The health professionals that, that have really worked very hard mm -hmm. to make the world a little bit better and the researchers and all the other individuals who have made the breakthroughs that have made it a little bit better for many, many other types of patients. That we have. But we've got to keep it going. 